Hello everyone, today we're going to cover the anatomy and procedures involving the cervical spine. First of all, a quick recap on the anatomy of the cervical vertebrae. Remember there are seven in number. They occupy the neck region. They've got you some unique features. They've got those transverse foramina that are located on the transverse processes for protection of the vertebral artery, and you have the bifid spinous processes. Uh, the first two are atypical. Uh, they join uh, to the skull. You've got C1, which is the atlas, C2, which is the axis, and then C7 is also atypical, um, and it joins with the T-spine. A little bit about the anatomy for the atlas again. You have the anterior arch, posterior arch, so there's no body, two lateral masses, two transverse processes. As I mentioned, C1 has no vertebral body. The superior articular processes receive the condyles of the occipital bone of the skull. For C2, it has a conical process called the dens or the odontoid on the upper anterior portion of the uh, body. Odontoid is received into the anterior ring of C1. So where the body would be uh, normally of C1, you've got the odontoid process. Here are two pictures of the uh, anatomy of C1 and C2. Uh, once again, note that you have a, a ligament that uh, crosses in C1 called the transverse atlantal ligament. Uh, that's going to separate the odontoid from where the spinal cord would be. You've got the transverse foramina. And then you have on C2 the dens or the odontoid, that tooth-like process. C7 is also called the vertebra prominence because of its long prominent spinous process. It's very palpable in the lower neck area. Here you can see uh, on the typical cervical vertebra that uh, bifid spinous process, the tip of it uh, is split basically. Um, and once again, you have those uh, transverse foramina for the location and protection of the uh, vessels that are going to go to the brain. We'll start on the general procedural guidelines. Uh, we're going to talk about patient preparation, general patient position, IR collimated field size, the SID, where to place the ID markers, radiation protection, and patient instructions. For patient preparation, uh, you need to have the patient remove all of the artifacts from the anatomy of interest. So since you're going to be x-raying the cervical area, any earrings have to come off, uh, necklaces, uh, generally you have the patient take off their, um, their uh, shirt, have them put on a hospital gown so clothing artifacts won't be in the way. Uh, and then, of course, you secure all patient possessions in the designated manner and location. One thing that I want to note that's not on this uh, slide is that if the patient does have dentures, uh, bridges, or anything that comes out of the mouth area that needs to be removed for the cervical spine, uh, especially when you're going to be x-raying the upper cervical region, uh, the open mouth, for example. Ambulatory patients can be done upright or recumbent. Non-ambulatory, of course, you'd have to have them recumbent. For trauma patients, uh, move the IR in the central ray to obtain images to maximize patient safety. Chapter 13 on page 30, uh, you can look at that uh, for some more information. The IR collimated field size. Uh, textbook does give you guidelines as you're reading through Merrill's. Uh, you're going to use the smallest IR that will demonstrate the anatomy. So generally, 8 by 10 size collimation will uh, suffice. Collimate the field size to the anatomy of interest. SID is standardized at 60 to 72 inches. Um, of course, 72 inches is going to be for the lateral because you've got that very uh, big OID between the cervical spine and the detector. 
IR markers, right or left markers, must be included on each image. Remember, you always place the correct marker on the correct side of the patient. Right marker, right side of patient, left marker, left side of patient. Um, although it's done frequently, Miro suggests uh, that you avoid digital annotation. Uh, you want to use your lead markers. And then any other required ID markers have to be on the blocker or elsewhere on the final image. For protection, uh, she pediatric patients, patients of reproductive age, uh, there are guidelines on pages 33 and 34 of volume one. Uh, of course, you're gonna always closely collimate uh, for protection and also for better image quality. Remember, the closer you collimate, the less scatter. Um, and then you're gonna use the optimum technique factors. For patient instructions, you're gonna explain and demonstrate the positions whenever possible, uh, respiration suspended, during most C-spine essential projections, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, specialized ones that are listed here, uh, the lateral, uh, the open mouth, and the swimmers, and uh, we'll get to talking about that in just a moment. So, uh, the essential projections in Merrill's that you're going to be uh, question about on the registry would be the AP, which is called the Fuchs, uh, for the DENS, the AP open mouth positions for C1 and C2, AP axial, the lateral, which is called the Grandy method, and then the lateral in hyperflexion and hyperextension. AP axial obliques, these are your RPO and your LPO. Your PA axial obliques, remember, would be your RAO, LAO. Remember, uh, AP uh, projection means that it's entering anterior on the patient, exiting posterior, and of course PA would be the opposite. We'll also talk about the uh, lateral, the swimmers, the cervical uh, thoracic region radiograph. As far as the AP is concerned, there is an AP projection called the Fuchs method. Um, because the patient's head has to be uh, brought way back, the chin has to be brought way up for this uh, projection, uh, the Fuchs method is contraindicated if there is a suspected fracture, if there is a disease that would prevent the patient from bringing their head all the way back. And on this one, only the upper part of the dens is demonstrated. You're not going to see the joint spaces on this one. For the Fuchs, the patient is supine. As I mentioned, you extend the chin until the tip is vertical. The mid-sagittal plane of the head is perpendicular to the IR. Central right perpendicular enters patient on MSP. Just distal to the chin tip, you're going to actually kind of skim the uh, tip of the chin in a very small collimated field 5 by 5 for the open mouth projection uh, for C1 and C2, the patient is supine. You're going to align the edge of the upper incisors and the mastoid tip perpendicular to the IR. So you have the patient open their mouth. You look to the bottom of the upper teeth, and then you imagine a line from the bottom of the upper teeth going to the and through the mastoid tip. Now remember, your mastoid tip is that kind of triangular structure right behind your ear and you want to go right to the tip so you're going to adjust the head so that a line from the upper incisors the top teeth and a line into the mastoid tip and then perpendicular to the ir uh, and of course then you open the mouth as wide as possible for all of these views as i'm going through that these uh, please make sure that you have Merrill's open and you're looking at the images the central ray is directed then perpendicular to the IR, enters the patient at the midpoint of their open mouth, so right at the corners of the mouth, and once again, a very small collimated field. For the AP axial, the patient is either upright or supine. It's an axial, so you're going to angle your central ray on this one. Shoulders are in the same horizontal plane. MSP is aligned with the long axis of your IR. C4, which is about at the Adam's apple, is in the, is in the center of the IR. MSP of head perpendicular, 
and you're going to extend that chin to place the occlusal plane perpendicular to the tabletop. So once again, the head is brought back. Because it is an axial, you are going to angle. Uh, central ray is going to be directed through C4, Adam's apple area. Uh, remember, Adam's apple is your thyroid cartilage at a 15 to 20 degree cephalid angle. Collimated field, 10 inches long, one inch beyond the skin line on both sides. Let's move on to the lateral. The lateral is called the Grandy method. Lateral projections demonstrate the zygopophyseal joints of the cervical spine. Now this is much different than the lumbar and the thoracic where your obliques demonstrated the zygopophyseal joints. So in the C-spine, the lateral demonstrates the zygopophyseal joints. Patient position, uh, upright, seated, or standing, uh, because you're going to have to bring the patient's arms and shoulders down. MSP is perpendicular, uh, MCP, I'm sorry, is perpendicular to the IR. MSP is parallel to the IR. And once again, your thyroid cartilage, C4, is in the center of your radiograph. Shoulders in the same horizontal plane, relax down, and then the chin is elevated, mandible is protruded. Central ray horizontal and perpendicular to the level of C4 again. We're going to go to mid neck, but at the level of C4. Collimated field 8 by 10 inches. Um, very important that if the top third of T1 is not demonstrated, you have to do a lateral of the cervical thoracic spine. This would be your swimmers. Okay, so you try and get all seven cervical vertebrae on your lateral, but if you can't, um, which a lot of times you can't because of the shoulders, you're going to have to do a swimmers. Let's move on to the hyperflexion, hyperextension. Uh, for either of these, because you're moving the head either down toward the chest or way back, uh, if there is a fracture or a pathology, uh, you're not going to do these because you're going to end up injuring the patient. Uh, these are used to demonstrate the absence or the normal movement from trauma or disease. Hyperflexion and hyperextension, patient uh, position upright, seated or standing. Part position, same as the lateral, grandy. Hyperextension, have the patient relax the head as far back as possible for extension. And for hyperflexion, have the uh, patient put their chin as close to the chest as possible. So when you bring the head back, that's hyperextension. When you bring the chin down, that's hyperflexion. Central ray is horizontal, and once again, perpendicular to the level of C4. You're not going right to C4, but at that level, mid-neck. Collimated field is 10 by 12 inches. Let's move on to the obliques. Uh, we're going to talk about the AP axial. Now, the PA are also talked about in Merrill's in the book itself, and I'd like you to know about those as well. Most places do do AP axial obliques. Now, what's very important, when you do AP obliques of the C-spine, the intervertebral foramina on the side farther from the IR are demonstrated. So if I did an LPO, the intervertebral foramina on the right side are what are going to be demonstrated. If I did the RPO, the intervertebral foramina on the left side are going to be demonstrated. So the intervertebral foramina farther from the IR with AP obliques, PA obliques then would obviously be the opposite. If I did an RAO, I would be demonstrating the intervertebral foramina on the right side. If I did an LAO, I would be demonstrating the intervertebral foramina on the left side, closest to the image receptor. We do both sides uh, for comparison. Patient positioning, uh, upright, seated, or standing, 45 degree posterior oblique position is preferred. You can do these recumbent, recumbent 45 degree posterior oblique position. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to do them recumbent. Uh, I want to say it's a lot more difficult, but it's a little bit more challenging sometimes. Uh, easier if you can to do them in the upright position. Part positioning, head and body are at 45 degree angle from IR. So both the head and the body 
are at 45 degrees. CR, I'm sorry, C spine is centered to the IR. IR is centered to C3, and the chin is elevated and protruded. Central ray is directed once again, C4, thyroid cartilage, 15 to 20 degrees cephalid. So AP obliques are 15 to 20 degrees cephalid. Use a collimated field, 8 by 10 inches. PA axial obliques, as I mentioned, uh, intervertebral foramina on side closer to IR demonstrated. Both sides would be done for comparison. For the PA axial, it's pretty much the same thing. You're upright or standing 45 degrees uh, for your part position, head and body at 45 degree angle to IR, C spine and center of IR, IR at level of uh, C5. Uh, chin elevated and protruded. Central ray, notice the difference, 15 to 20 degrees caudal or caudad for PA axials. Once again, your collimated field remains at about an 8 by 10 uh, inch field. Cervical thoracic region, the swimmers. This projection is needed when C7 is not well demonstrated on the lateral C-spine projection. So at most institutions, you only have to do this projection when you don't get all seven cervical vertebrae uh, on the lateral or grandi method. For the swimmers, patient position, upright, seated, or standing, true lateral position, Recumbent true lateral with head resting on arm or other firm support. So if they were recumbent, they'd be laying on their arm. MCP center to midline of grid. You're going to extend the arm closer to the IR above the head and rotate then the humeral head anteriorly. So a uh, hand goes up, arm goes up, and you rotate the humeral head anteriorly. If upright, you're going to flex the elbow, press the forearm on the head. Then you're going to depress the shoulder farther from the IR. So it's almost like the side closest to the IR is going up. The side farther from the IR is going down. Head and body are in a true lateral position. And the C7, T1 interspace should be in the center of your image. Central ray is perpendicular to C7, T1 interspace if the shoulder is away from the IR is uh, depressed. And if you can't depress that shoulder enough, you can use a slight angle of 3 to 5 degrees in a caudal um, uh, position. Collimated feel, uh, 10 by 12 inches. Something for you to think about, what is the CR angle and direction? for AP axial oblique projections of the cervical vertebrae. Okay, so remember AP, are you need is perpendicular, 15 to 20 degrees cephalid, 15 to 20 degrees caudal, or 45 degrees cephalid. I want you to make sure that you look up the answer in Merrill's if you don't know. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I want you to look it up uh, so you make sure that you know I can tell you it's not going to be perpendicular and it's not going to be 45 degrees cephalid. So um, are you angling caudal or cephalid? Make sure you take a look, look so that you make sure you get AP versus PA axial straight. For image evaluation criteria, essential projections of the C spine and the cervical thoracic. Uh, for the fuchs, evidence of proper collimation, the entire dens is within the foramen magnum. So that's very important. Anytime you, you see questions in register review books or on exams and they ask you about the Fuchs method, they ask you where's the dens, the odontoid going to be, it's going to be within the foramen magnum. Now the foramen magnum is a very large opening at the base of your skull through which the spinal cord then is going to exit uh, from the brain area. There is no rotation, mandible, cranium, and vertebrae are symmetric, and soft tissue and bony trabecular detail are seen. So here is a good Fuchs. You can see there is this, right in the middle, there is this blackened kind of circle, and then you see the tip of the odontoid coming up, 
that blackened circle area, that's the foramen magnum. And then you can see the top part of uh, C2, the odontoid process there. Now you don't really get a good view of the bottom of it because you've got then the uh, parts of the skull then in the way. For the AP, C1, and C2 open mouth, uh, evidence of proper collimation, dense atlas axis and articulations between the first and second cervical vertebrae, entire articular surfaces of the atlas and axis, and mouth is open wide. So uh, for this one, superimposed occlusal plane of the upper central incisors, base of skull, demonstrating proper neck flexion. This is very, very important, these next two points. If you're looking at your image and you notice that the teeth, the upper incisors are projected over the dens, then you'd know that the neck is flexed too much towards the chest. So when you repeat, you're gonna to have to bring the head back. Now, if you look at your image and you see that the base of the skull is projected over the dens, well, now you've extended the neck too much. So when you repeat then you're gonna to have to bring the chin a little bit closer uh, to the chest, or towards the chest, I should say. Uh, shadow of tongue not projected over the atlas and the axis. In your book, it talks about the patient phonating ah during your open mouth. It affixes the tongue to the floor of the mouth. The angles of the mandible, the mandibular rami, are equidistant from the dens. Uh, demonstrating proper head rotation, and you should see soft tissue and bony trabecular detail. So here is a view of the AP uh, open mouth. Uh, you can see on this, you see the odontoid tip. Now, if you look closely, you can see, remember, surrounding the odontoid tip is C1, and it's like a ring, and you can see the uh, the front, the anterior part of that ring is superimposing the odontoid process. Uh, you also see very nicely uh, the uh, joints between C1 and C2, those two black lines. Um, and you can see that the base of the skull and the teeth are not over the odontoid. Now, when you would do the fuchs is that if you've tried to do your AP open mouth and uh, you're, you're just not getting uh, the uh, odontoid not superimposed by the teeth or the base of the skull, that's when you would do the uh, fuchs. Or sorry, if, you, if the odontoid is being obscured by the teeth or the base of the skull, that is when you would do the fuchs. For the AP axial, uh, evidence of proper collimation, area from superior portion of C3 to T2 surrounding soft tissue. The shadows of the mandible and the occiput, which is the back of the uh, skull area, are superimposed over the atlas and most of the axis. This is why we have to do a separate view. We have to do that open mouth because you're not going to see C1 and C2 uh, on the AP axial. Uh, you're going to see open intervertebral disc spaces on this radiograph. Mid-sagittal plane of neck and uh, head perpendicular to plane of IR without any tilt or rotation. Spinous processes are equidistant to the pedicles aligned with the midline of the cervical bodies. Mandibular angles and mastoid processes are equidistant to the vertebrae and soft tissue and bony trabecular detail are seen. Here is a nice AP axial. I'd like you to make sure that you look at the top of the radiograph and that big kind of white circle there. Uh, that is the skull area. Um, and once again, it's obscuring C1 and C2. Uh, that's why you've got to do the open mouth. For the lateral C-spine, the Grandy method. Evidence of proper collimation, all seven cervical vertebrae and at least one third of T1 uh, should be seen otherwise a separate radiograph of the cervical thoracic regions recommended. Once again, you have the level of C4 right in the center of the radiograph. Uh, neck is extended, so the mandibular rami are not overlapping the atlas or axis. So you bring that chin up, usually then the bottom of the mandible, then uh, if you imagine a plane passing through the bottom of the mandible, it should be uh, parallel with the floor, basically. So you're bringing the head up. You don't want to extend it too much or not enough. So 
bring it up so that a plane passing uh, along the lower margins of the mandible are going to be parallel with the floor. There's no rotation or tilt of the cervical spine, superimposed zygopopyseal joints, and open intervertebral disc spaces are seen, superimposed or nearly superimposed rami, which are the angles of the mandible, uh, are seen, spinous processes are shown in profile, and you want to see soft tissue in any bony trabecular detail. Here is a good lateral of the C-spine. Uh, notice the mandibular rami, the angles of the mandible, are not touching the vertebrae, okay, the upper vertebrae. Uh, those mandible uh, rami, mandibular rami, are superimposed. Um, and if you count, you go all the way to that first uh, vertebrae right underneath the uh, skull area. That would be C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. Very nice for C7. And then you can also even start on this one to see a little bit of T1. Hyperflexion and hyperextension views. Uh, evidence of proper collimation. All seven cervical vertebrae are in a true lateral position. Uh, no rotation or tilt of the cervical spine. Superimposed zygopophyseal joints, open intervertebral disc spaces are seen, superimposed or nearly superimposed rami of the mandible, and then the spinous processes are shown in profile. And of course, always you want to see soft tissue and bony trabecular detail. For hyperflexion, body of mandible is almost vertical if normal, and all seven spinous processes are in profile elevated and widely separated. So when you take your chin, you bring it all the way down to your chest. What are you doing? You're separating the spaces between these spinous processes. For hyperextension, you're going to bring the head all the way back so the body of the mandible is almost horizontal uh, to the floor. And what are you going to do? All seven spinous processes are in profile, but they're depressed and closely spaced together. So here are the uh, two images. Look at the hyperflexion. Look at the spinous processes behind. Notice the distance between the spinous processes. They're widely separated. And then in hyperextension, when you bring the head all the way back, uh, now take a look at the spinous processes. They're much closer together. Apexial oblique uh, C-spine, evidence of proper collimation, all seven cervical and first thoracic vertebrae are seen. Uh, appropriate 45 degree rotation of body and neck. AP, open intervertebral foramina, farthest from the IR, from C2 to 3 and C7 to T1. Uniform size and contour of the foramina. Appropriately elevated chin, mandibles not overlapping the atlas and axis, the occipital bone, which is the skull bone, is not overlapping the atlas and axis. You want to see open intervertebral disc spaces, soft tissue, and bony trabecular detail. Here is an AP axial oblique of the cervical spine. Notice those black holes then that you're seeing uh, immediately behind the uh, vertebral bodies. Those are the intervertebral foramina. This is what you're looking at. You want to see those black holes there. For PA axial obliques, all seven cervical vertebrae again, once again 45 degree rotation. The biggest thing about your PA axial obliques is the open intervertebral foramina now are closest to the IR. So if I do an RAO and that's a PA axial, RAO, I'm going to see the intervertebral foramen on the right side. If I do an LAO, I'm going to see the intervertebral foramen on the left side. And these uh, vertebrae should be uniform, uh, and the contours of the foramen should be uh, seen uh, and equal. Appropriate elevated chin, mandible not overlapping the atlas and axis, occipital bone not overlapping axis and atlas and axis. Open intervertebral disc spaces and soft tissue and bony trabecular detail. Here is a PA axial oblique. Once again, the arrow is pointing to the intervertebral uh, foramen, and it would be the uh, intervertebral foramen on the side closest to the IR since it's a PA axial. 
And then for the swimmers, proper collimation, adequate penetration through the shoulder region and upper thoracic vertebrae. Uh, they're not appreciably rotated from the lateral position. Humeral heads are minimally superimposed on the vertebral column, soft tissue and bony trabecular detail. And here we have a swimmers, and you can see there's a lot of overlap uh, of the uh, uh, ver vertebrae by the uh, clavicle, for example. You can see the two clavicles there, one going up, one going down. But it does give you a good view, at least of uh, C7, if you can't get that in the Grandi uh, method.